Welcome to We Plus You, straight talk about conscious business collaborations. And I'm really excited today because I have Mary C. Kelly with me once again. And she is brilliant, a brilliant author, a brilliant conversationalist and speaker. So welcome, Mary. Thanks, Carly. It's great to be here today. It is. I always love it when I have you because we have some brilliant conversations and we also bring wonderful tips and tools to the public when I'm really always excited about delivering some wonderful content to people. So I'm going to bring this over to you because I know you know exactly what you want to talk to talk about today. So, Thanks, Carly. So one of the things I wanted to talk to our listeners and audience today was about money. And the government shutdown this week threw about um, almost a million government workers out of a job for an indefinite period of time. And many people have had pink slips where they were they thought they had a job on Thursday and then they came to work on Friday and got the slip and had no job after Friday. So this sudden loss of income is a topic that I think is very near and dear to many people right now. And I think you experienced some of this back in 9-11, didn't you? I did. And, and the thing that most people don't get is, as you and I were talking about, is this ripple effect. And it's not just us. It is this thing that's beyond us. And we don't think it's, it's the workers that we don't even see. It's the groundskeeper. It's the people that are actually cleaning toilets, you know, bathrooms, maintenance workers that we aren't even thinking about. It's way beyond us. That's exactly right. So the ripple effect that you're talking about in the world of economics, we call that money velocity. And how often money changes hands is an indication of how healthy the economy is. So you've heard of consumer confidence, for example, as part of how well our economy is doing. So just to remind your viewership, 70% of our gross domestic product is consumer spending. So let's just say 1 million American workers and and in the American population we only have about 13, uh, 316 million Americans but only about one-third of those are actively working so a million people is a significant part of our workforce and let's just say those people are suddenly not working it's not just those people who are impacted it's the people who support those people who go to work it's the restaurants nearby those places where those government workers work it's the dry cleaners it's the people who are contracted to clean those spaces it's the people who now can't get in to deliver supplies because there's no one there to receive them it's all kinds of those other things that and those are the people who are impacted when we say there's this government shutdown so you're absolutely right it is if you recall the hockey strike the baseball strike it was the people who sold hot dogs it was the people who painted the parking lots it was the people who parked the cars it was the extra security it was all those people who in turn didn't get that added income because of that particular hockey strike or baseball strike or whatever and this slows down the money that's being spent in the economy when people feel as though their job is uncertain or their future income is threatened they stop spending and this is part of that consumer confidence that we're so concerned with because when that consumer confidence which is seventy percent of our GDP drops we have a big shift in what happens in our American economy we estimate that for if the government shutdown goes beyond 30, for thirty days it will drop our GDP by one percent and that's a huge amount of impact when you look at who is suffering through all this so sometimes we say oh government workers well they can afford to take a few weeks off but it's far it's far greater than that bureaucrat who's making a decent income we also have some government workers who are making barely above minimum wage and those people are hurting pretty badly right now and that's what people don't get it's like think about how hard it is to live on minimum wage and how hard yeah. it is to save. People have no concept what it's like to live on minimum wage. I really want people to think about that. Think about how much minimum wage is, then think about how to pay rent if you have a car, having to have car insurance, mm -hmm. you know, and actually add up what it is to pay utilities, mm -hmm. and God forbid, you know, literally then having a child, put, you know, putting clothes on that child's back, medical expenses and all that, and then attempt to save money doing all that. Well, I mean, you uh, seriously yeah. think about all that, and then right. getting laid off, and then right. okay, how are you going to actually then live and then right. pay rent the next month? Right, and then and of course 
And of course, minimum wage was never meant to be a living wage, really. It was meant to be a starting wage because we don't have any other version of a starting wage in the United States. And the percentage of people who are on a minimum wage um, for any, any period of time is actually quite low. So generally, it, there's something called the theory of efficiency wages. And what that means is if you're an employer, you tend to pay your workers um, ideally as much as you possibly can for a few reasons first let's say I'm paying you fifty dollars an hour to uh, do PowerPoint and somebody else is paying you ten dollars an hour to do PowerPoint when I call you on a Sunday afternoon you were gonna go shopping or you were gonna go out to dinner but I say Carly I need you guess what's gonna happen you're gonna be really responsive to me at fifty dollars an hour if somebody's just paying you ten dollars an hour you're not gonna be that responsive so if you pay people better they respond by being better workers number one and number two if you pay people well they will be more loyal to you and it's not just money it's all other sorts of appreciation and and ideally you keep them longer and so your best people you want to incentivize them working for you so that's kind of the minimum wage thing what I wanted to also bring in for your listenership today was as you know last April I published a book called Money Smart how not to buy cat food when you don't have a cat and I wanted to tell you how that all started back when I was in San Diego for executive officer school I was sitting in this course and the woman next to me said um, are you invested in the stock market and I said yes and she said I'm afraid of the stock market and I said I'm afraid of being old and having to buy cat food when I don't have a cat and what I meant by that was you know we as humans can survive on cat food for a long period of time the idea is if you see somebody in the grocery store it always makes me worry that when they're buying cat food and I go oh I hope you have a cat at home I hope you're not surviving on that cat food so that was kind of the comical title for this book but the idea is to help our young people those ages 18 to 30 who are starting out to prepare for their future be smarter about their money than sometimes other generations we say other generations but it's and I'm not blaming other generations but right now our 18 to 30 year olds are going to face financial things that our generation and maybe our, our parents generation didn't have to so I think they have to be a little bit smarter does that make sense absolutely and I would love for you to actually give some tips to people so how can people in that age bracket be smarter about money well and right now this is a great opportunity to um, talk about how to save money and what they can do so let's talk about young people for just a second and then let's roll into but what do we do if we just don't have that extra money or if we find ourselves suddenly out of a job so if you're a young person right now one of the key points I try to make is that 59 and a half is not that far away and that is the time when you can start taking money out of your individual retirement account whether it's a Roth or whether or not it's a regular IRA or individual retirement account many young people and many other people don't don't put money away simply for a few basic reasons first they number one think that they don't have enough money to start with when in fact even fifty dollars a month adds up faster than most people think and second if they put money away they don't know where to put it the average savings account right now is only getting a 0.25 percent rate of return on savings and that's terrible four and a half years ago just to give you perspective on this um, my savings account at my credit union was giving me 4.165 percent so the difference in what we're able to save right now and the rate of return is dramatically different just in four and a half years so they don't know where to put it that's going to give them any rate of return and then the third thing is there's sort of this when you're young our brains are and you know this our brains are predisposed to take risks when we are young between the ages of 16 and 24 we have a an excitement about risk and that's part of our genetic composition so if we're under 24 frequently we still think we're invincible and we think well of course we're gonna be young and healthy forever and we're never gonna need to worry about being older and and maybe you know facing things that when we get older things start to break so there's a sense of an invincibility and there's also a sense of but I wanna have fun now so when I talk to young people those four points first you do probably make enough even on minimum wage to save a little bit the tiniest amount still adds up 
and getting it into a right place such as a Roth IRA is a great way to start out and you don't have to spend a lot of money to do it you can take open a Roth IRA and you can put it into an index fund that's going to give you a fairly decent rate of return even now even now we're looking at some big big economic issues and the idea is to get people to understand that the money does make a difference over the long haul and if you don't have a decent nest egg in your 30s it makes being 60 much harder simply because of the magic of compound interest now, so can I, here's the thing yeah some people are not going to know what compound interest means so can you explain Thank what you. compound interest means yes thank you so much compound interest is what happens when money is left to multiply over time so there's a neat thing we can do using the number 72 so if you take the number 72 and you divide that by the number of years you are going to invest something so let's say 72 divided by 10 years means that you'll double your money or uh, you'll double your money in 10 years and that rate of return is 7.2% and and the same math works. So let's say you have you have a um, nine percent rate of return on something. So seventy two divided by nine means that you're going to double your money every eight years. So it's a quick way to show people if you're getting a two percent rate of return, it's going to take thirty six years to double your money. If you're getting a one percent rate of return, it's going to take seventy two years to double that money. So it's it's really not growing for you. If you can get a 20% rate of return, and I'm the first one to say you can't always get that, but wouldn't it be nice if you could, you know, you're doubling your money in less than four years. And all of a sudden, my young people start to do the math, and over time they say, oh, in 20 years, even at $50 a month, I could have a couple hundred thousand dollars. I could do this. And all of a sudden it becomes attainable. So this is the magic of compound interest. And you can go on almost any financial website and say compound interest or investing calculator and just throw in some numbers. What does $80 a month get you? What does $100 a month get you? And what those rates of return over time. And if you start even 10 years later, even 10 years later, and you can hear my puppy maybe in the background, um, you know, you're talking about the difference of millions of dollars just by waiting. So in in the book Money Smart, Money Smart, Money Smart, there are a couple chapters that t there's a chapter um, completely devoted to compound interest and I find that once once my young people get the compound interest idea down, they they really understand a little bit more about why it's so important to do this. So compound interest and I have some examples in chapter 5. For example, if you can get a 12% rate of return, um, just $50 a month over 50 years, you know, you're looking at almost $2 million. So that's amazing. And, I, and what I love about your books, I've read several of them, is that they're, show the book again. It's small. Short. Sure. I'm going to stop talking so you can show it. Okay. So, go ahead. It's it's small. It's easy to read. There's 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 cartoons. Yeah. So what I love about her books is they all of them, all the books that she has are small. They're easy to read. She, they're very tips and tools, and you know you can read them in a day, mm -hmm. and and they're really valuable. And that's what I love about her books. All of them are like that. They're just very simple. They're not complicated. They're things that you can really apply. And, and I, I, that to me is a valuable book. I don't like books that you read them, they're so complicated, and you want to put them on the shelf and you don't use them. So well, I really you. encourage you to read her books and actually apply what she says in there. Because if you read the book and you don't do anything with it, it's not going to do you any good. So read the book and actually apply the steps that are in there. When I was in graduate school, my teachers kept saying that I needed more fluff in my writing. I needed to use more words. And I said, but I'm just trying to get to the point. And so some people have said that my books uh, read a little bit too short because I try I make points really fast, but I appreciate that you appreciate that. No, I, it's it's like I don't like books that have all the fluff in it. I want to know what are the points, what are the steps, and then what to do. And I want something that's fast and easy to read. I don't want like a you know two hundred page book. I want something that's short, pithy, and to the point. And so that's why I love them. It's basically here's what I need to do. Here are the tips, here are the tools, and then the let's go. 
Thank you, you know, so, so it, it's something that you can read in a day, and you can actually go back to it over and over again and apply what needs to be done. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. So they're they're designed to be short reads, easy easy to understand, and fast to implement. Because we just don't have extra time right now. And if you want to read, if you want a long, nice, you know, novel or something like that, there are people out there who are writing those. <laughs> Yeah, I and mean, there's obviously I mean, there's lots of other people that have really good books. I'm just saying if you want something that's easy to read, that's short and to the point, she has wonderful books. I mean, I just that's just my personal opinion. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, our some of our government workers and I've been talking to several this week because many people were really not expecting this to happen. And they looked at me and they said, "Mary, what do I do?" I said, "Okay, first off, number 1, don't panic." This is a great time to sit down with your family, gather up all of the bills you have, all of your expenses, and say, you know what, we're probably not getting paid, and we're not getting paid for we don't even know how long, so we've got to make sure that everything we do, all of our expenses, are exactly where the money needs to be going now. So gather up everything you're spending money on, and then prioritize it. Things that you need to keep paying, your rent or your mortgage, your utilities, your gas bill, your water and trash, your car payment, your insurance. Now is not the time to forego your medical insurance, your dental insurance, your car insurance, your life insurance, your house insurance. Keep up the insurances. There are other things that you may look at and say, if I don't have a job fairly quickly, I need to cut. And people who have been out of and been out of work this last couple of years know this. Things that are easy to cut that you're going to have to do are eating out drinking out, going to movies, um, cut the gym membership, you know, find a nice neighborhood to walk in, um, stop spending money on things you absolutely don't need such as your cable. Uh, your, you can cut your cable costs. You can call your cable company and say, hey, um, I've just been furloughed or I suddenly found myself without a job and I need a cheaper plan. And you can do the same with your cell phones. You can call them up and say, I need a cheaper plan. What can you do for me? So enlist the help of other people to help you cut the costs that are necessary. Now I have a friend who tells his six kids, wool is cheaper than heat. And he keeps his house, even in the winter, at 62 degrees. That's a little too cold for me, but I can, I can kind of see his point where he says, you know, we were so used to having it so comfortable that, uh, you know, a little bit of a, you know, he says, put on a sweater. So I know when I go to his house I have to put on a sweater, but he takes it a little bit too extreme, but he knows exactly what he wants to spend and on what. And other things are people that are, are furloughed workers are having to look at is, will I have a Christmas vacation? Will I have a Christmas? Will I be able to take a summer vacation? Um, I've got some trips coming up, maybe they're for pleasure. We may simply not be able to afford that. Um, when people are out of work a long time, Things that also change in terms of buying behavior, of course, they don't buy those new cars, they don't buy new appliances, they sometimes put car repairs on hold, I think that's a little dangerous, but that happens, and they, they have to look at where the money, if they're paying someone else, they have to look at that and say, is that really necessary? So if you're paying someone to shampoo the carpets in your house, you might want to think about doing that yourself. Um, maybe somebody else has been coming out to do your winter landscaping. Maybe you need to do that yourself. Maybe you need to clean your own house. Maybe instead of going to the bakery for the birthday cake, maybe you need to bake that yourself. You can make a cake for about three bucks. It costs you twenty dollars to buy it. It's pretty good cost savings. So all the things that you can pay other that you're paying other people to do, you need to look at and say, is that really an expense we need if we don't have the income? Now, ideally, all the financial planners will say, well, but you should have three to six months in an emergency fund. Well, that's great, unless you don't have that. And this is a great reminder, this furlough, that we do need an emergency fund, even if you do think your job is secure. And I agree. And one of the things we brought up that was really important is the insurance thing. So many people I know are insurance right now. And you never know when something's going to happen. And it, you can be the safest driver in the world. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. There's always something that can happen that isn't your fault. So insurances, keeping up the insurances, are really, really, really important. And you're right. We, are, we need to take responsibility for our own lives. And we can do things. 
we think that we're, you know, we can't do things. Like you said, baking the cake, cleaning our own house, washing our own cars, shampooing our own carpets. We, there's so many things that we can do. We take for granted so many things. <laughs> we just, you know, we, we take for granted the lights, the water. We, when we brush our teeth, I know so many people when they're brushing their teeth have the water running. When you're brushing your teeth, turn the water on. Then turn the water on when you're rinsing your mouth. And we just take for granted so many things. We leave all the lights on in the house. We mm -hmm. leave the air conditioning on when we don't need it on. We leave the fans on when we're not in the house. There's just so many things we just forget about. And we need to be more conscious, more awake. When we leave a room, turn the light off. There's just, just so many things that we're just not awake about anymore. We're just so used to having the money and being comfortable and leaving all these things on. We just need to be more conscious and more aware. So, you know, eat, and, that, and this is, you know, what I'm, why I'm saying this is because for me, it doesn't matter if I have money or don't have money. Some of these things we need to think about even when we do have money. It's like, why do, why even when we have money, do we leave all the lights on in the house? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of funny. You're saying this only when, we, when we're in a furlough. I'm saying even when we're not in a furlough, be more aware, be more conscious. So that when you do leave a room, turn the light off. When you do leave a room, do you need to have a fan on? I'm just, you know, I'm just saying it's an interesting time that we're in this furlough that we should actually wake up and think about some of the things that we do. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Oh, you're absolutely right. And what people also frequently don't see is little things add up. You know, those little changes in your life really do add up. Look around your house and and I think one of my furlough people said, I'm just so scared. And I said, yes, I understand you're scared, but that means you have to take action. So look around your house and figure out what you can do to make your living space more efficient. And for many people, that means cleaning out a room, cleaning out your closet, purging stuff that you don't need. Make your life simpler. Take this opportunity to simplify your life of things that are, if they're not giving you joy, if they're not something you absolutely need, and if they're not things you use regularly, you probably don't need them. So this is also a good time to say, okay, other people are hurting worse than me, so what can I do to help them too? And I know you share that sentiment. You do it all the time. Exactly, and that's what I'm saying. It's kind of like when I went through 9-11, it was an amazing purging experience because I was caught in the middle of everything. Because I didn't have someone that died, and I lost everything on both sides because my clients lost their jobs mm -hmm. so they couldn't I had I, I was working at 9-11 in the tower I lost my job and then of course all our paychecks were gone and I had to work with FEMA and, and then the funny part is FEMA if you chose to move to get a job you lost all your benefits so you were stuck you couldn't move it, unless you lost because you lose all your benefits and it was crazy I had, I, I had an opportunity to move to get a new job but then I lost all my benefits, and of course your new benefits didn't start for like two months. And then it was like all this craziness. And then my clients on the other side, they lost their job, so I had, I had a studio on the other side of New Jersey. However, I couldn't get anything on that side either. It was just craziness. I was like in the cracks of everything. And people don't understand that. So I took that time, literally, like you said, I purged everything. Everything that I had, I would actually help others, and I would donate this, and I'd donate, donate that. And I did. I looked at everything. What didn't I need anymore? What clients, you know, could I actually help? And so I did. I actually still trained some clients. I still actually took on some consulting clients and let them and like kind of still train them and with the with the understanding that they would pay me when they actually got another job. It was mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Like we were kind of doing like a barter until they got back on their feet. Because I was like, what are you, what are you gonna do? I couldn't get another job. They couldn't get another job too. They got another job. And everybody's hands were tied. It's like we had to just sit on your butt all day long. It's like you had to do with what you could do. It was it was just a very interesting time, and it was you know just chaotic. And then then you felt guilty because I didn't have someone that personally died, but you were still alive. So it was like all this dynamic that was going on. It was fascinating. And it's a, it's a very emotional time. There are people who are going through a grief process when they don't have a job, and you know that our unemployment's been quite bad for the last few years and if we look at the simple unemployment number that you see we're nationally about 7.3 percent we should be around 4.1 percent and if you look at the real numbers there's another seven percent of discouraged workers or underemployed workers that's the rocket scientist 
who now, because they shut down the space program, is working managing a Wendy's, underemployment, or the people who have simply given up working, they're not collecting benefits because they simply feel as though they've exhausted all of the avenues to try to get a job. That number is closer to 14%. And we've seen the grief process with those people when they give up or when they become so scared that they're not going to have this job. And it becomes a very emotional issue. So what you and I think both share is we say we understand and we recognize the emotions involved with not having a job or not working or having a loss of income. So let's take concrete action that gives us control over our lives and helps us regain the control we need in order to move forward and not be mired in that grief and uncertainty. So one of the phrases I like is choosing to be not a victim, a victor. So taking actions that are going to take you out of that energy of woe is me, I'm in a furlough, what can I do to be victorious over that? So what action steps can I take through this to get me in a more positive light? You know, what steps can I take to do whatever I can to get to the other side, if you will, or see the light at the end of the tunnel? And there's a few things that people can do, and especially if you're newly furloughed or you're, you've, you're looking at a job loss for an extended period of time. So there's a few things you can do. First, call your credit card companies and say, I've just lost my job. Can you help me with a lower interest rate? Now they will either say yes or no. If they say yes, great. If they say no, ask is there someone else and be really nice. These are frontline customer service people and they get beat up a lot. So be very nice to these people. Say I've been a great customer for 35 years and I've recently been furloughed. I am going to be using my credit cards more during this furlough period, can you please help me with a lower interest rate? If they say no, say, is there someone else there who might be able to help me with this? Because frequently, your frontline person might not have the experience or the level of ability to change that if it's on the line. And then if they get a manager involved, that manager can sometimes help. If, the man if they say no, there's nobody here, call back at a different time. If you call on a Saturday, call on a Monday afternoon. Call back on a Tuesday morning and you might get someone else and they might be able to help you. And again, be really nice. So that's one thing you can do. The second thing you can do is call your bank and ask for a line of credit that backs up your checking account. Many times we forget the automatic things that come out of our checking account when we have a job, such as our mortgage payment, our rent payment, our homeowner's dues, our maintenance fees, our electric bill, our utilities, whatever. There's sometimes automatic payments and we forget they're there. And you don't want to go into a deficit. You, know, you don't want to go below that zero point and then get you know, slammed with a $50 fee. So ask for a backup line of credit. And most banks will do that for you, especially if you've got other assets or something like that. Um, or if you just explain the situation, a line of credit I also find very helpful. And then third, pull out your credit cards, the ones that you use as well as the ones you haven't used in a while. And remember, credit cards only have a grace period if you have a zero balance. So let's say you meant to pay off your credit card last month, but you thought the furlough might be coming, so you paid $300 on a $600 bill. So you still owe $300. That means every single purchase that you use that card for automatically starts incurring interest. So there is no grace period for those new purchases. So you might want to pull out those other credit cards, the ones you don't use very often, and if they've got zero balance on them, you might want to use those in the short term so that you're not incurring extra interest on purchases that you know you're not sure you can pay off right away does that make sense absolutely and you're absolutely right I know when I like I said the 9-11 you can usually work with people I found calling you know the electric company calling all the people that you had like any credit anything they usually will work with you you can call your like you said call anyone cell phone bill electric bill all mm -hmm. those people and tell them that you're on furlough and again like she said be nice. The nicer you are and you say, hey, this is what's going on, they will work with you because they know what's going on. They know the government shut down. So if you do tell them what's going on, they usually will work with you. 
again, though, the key here is not being hysterical, it's not being mean, it's being nice, saying, hey, this is what's mm -hmm. going on, can you please either, whatever the situation is, either lower my interest, give me, you know, 30 extra days, I'm working on getting either, you know, a loan for my family, or I'm working on, whatever it is that you're working on to help your situation, tell them, just be honest, tell them what's going on, and they usually will work with you. And they, and they usually really will. I know companies that will either lower, like you said, just out of courtesy, they'll lower your plan without charging you. They will lower your cable and let you still even keep your cable plan, just charge you less. All you can do is ask, and the bottom line is, if you don't ask, you'll never know. The worst that can happen is that they say no. And again, like she said, always ask to speak to somebody else. If the first person says no, always ask to speak to somebody else, a supervisor, hang up, call another time. Don't just give up. Always ask for somebody else. Never, ever give up. There's always a way if you want something badly enough. You're absolutely yeah. right. And when I talk to my young people, they say, well, I just don't have the extra money. So I have a chapter in the book called How to Find Cash When the Couch Cushions Come Up Empty. You know, have you ever dug for change in the couch cushions or, or if you've ever driven in New Jersey and you, go and you go, oh gosh, I don't have change, and you start digging around in the cushions, that's what I'm referring to. So there's a few things that our people, our young people especially, are, can be mindful of, but also if you're suddenly in this place where you don't have income, a few ideas. First, stay away from temptation. Don't go shopping. If you can't afford it, you don't buy it. And don't put yourself in a situation where you'll be tempted. Only go shopping for food in grocery stores. And if you want to be healthy about it, try to stick to the outer perimeter of the grocery store. It's cheaper, it's fresh food, and you're going to be making everything yourself anyway. Fresh food is cheaper than processed food. So a few things there. So again, stay away from shopping malls, don't watch ads on late night TV, don't go to online shopping sites, don't don't go any place where you could possibly spend money. Don't go to the mall, not even to walk around because you could be tempted. So keep away from anything that's going to tempt you is is one idea. Um, number two is say no to solicitations. And I know that we all try to help our neighbors when it comes time to the the chili sale or the cookie sale. By the way, I love Girl Scout cookies and I think everybody should buy lots of Girl Scout cookies. But they can, but if you truly can't afford it, you're going to have to say no to those solicitations from your neighbors or if your friend says they're trying to start a business and can you please help them by buying fill in the blank. If somebody is having a home party and you know there's going to be sales going on there, just say no. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. And this is such good advice that um, I remember growing up is my family lived by the idea that if you can't afford it, you don't buy it period. If you can't afford it, that's it. You don't get to get to buy something that you simply can't afford. And if you don't have money, you don't you stop spending. Period. And by having that mindset, it takes you out of the oh, I'll just get this this cappuccino just this once or or those types of indulgence expenditures that sometimes we mindlessly do. One of the other points is to recognize your buying behavior. I had a group of young people and I said, why do you spend this on this name brand? And they said, because we deserve it. And I said, no, you don't deserve it. That's an emotional statement thinking that if you feel like you deserve this, then you're buying on an emotional level. And it was a bunch of young men who said, we're not emotional buyers. I said, but if you think you deserve it, that's an emotion. So you need to recognize that if you say, oh, I've had a really hard week, I deserve this. That's still emotional spending. And many people do get that, and you know this, that surge of adrenaline, those endorphins get released when we, make, when we go shopping. Um, we've also found some NLP activity that says you can go shopping you just don't, and, and you get the same rush of, of chemicals in your brain that make you feel good even if you don't buy it. So you, if you've got the discipline, you can go to the store, look for things to shop, and then, and then put it there on hold and say, if I truly do want it I, and really think I need it, I can come back in 48 hours and get it. And for the most part, we've already gotten that chemical feel-good feeling from shopping and we really don't need it. 
And the same is true for online shopping. You can shop online if you know you're not going to buy and get that same rush without hitting the buy button. And then you can so you can have the fun of the browsing and the shopping without the guilt and the the monetary burden later. But again, for people who you're not sure if you're if you're going to press that buy button, I would just say stay away from the temptation. Yeah, most people don't realize that endorphins and the things that happen in our body it's like the same thing with emotional eating. The same thing, we have these endorphins that get released. When we eat emotionally, it's endorphins that are getting released. The same thing with shopping. So you have, it's, it's, that's why there's all these addictions, if you will. I mean, there's addictions and there's people that can, can actually, like you said, press a button or not press the button. So you really do have to know what type of person you are. Can you actually not hit the button or can you actually really look and be okay with that? So you have to be really brutally honest with yourself. Can you or can't you? So you know you just have to be know yourself really well and be honest with yourself and do the best that you can do. And this is important. This is a time that you really need to know that you can actually do what you need to do so that you can get through this furlough and keep yourself safe and your family safe and basically keep everybody. And you, the most important thing is through this furlough, Make sure that you're smiling and laughing and staying in some sort of, because you got to remember, your mind is, re is releasing these endorphins. Negativity is also releasing a different type of chemical. So make sure you're doing things that are releasing positive endorphins. This is so important. Yes, it's sad and you're, and you're, and you're actually going through the grieving process and there are going to be times that you just really want to throw up your hands in the air and go, I give up, if you will. Make sure you're doing things that make you smile and laugh. Surround yourself with, with people that are going to support you through this. Your friends, your environment. Like you said, clean things out. You take this time to make your space nice. Clean it up. Get it organized. Make your space with light. In other words, bring in light in your space. Make your, your space a positive space to be in. You want to keep your energy and your, your, your attitude positive through this because if you drown yourself in negativity this is going to be a really hard time. Yes, it's not fun to be in a furlough. At the same time, make sure your attitude doesn't go down with it. Make sure you surround yourself, get a support system in place, and get yourself through this with a positive attitude as much as possible. And um, it's funny that you should say that because I wrote a blog post that was um, 15 things to do while you're furloughed. And it was things like, hey, get that do-it-yourself project done. Paint the bathroom. Um, buy your Christmas cards. Get that done now. Um, make time to have, you know, a meal with friends. Have friends over. Um, make sure you're, you know, get get out for a walk. You know, sleep. We're so sleep deprived as a nation. This is a wonderful opportunity to get caught up on some sleep. You know, make a list of things that you can get accomplished during this time and really take advantage of this extra time that you have. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, is, is people get wrapped up and they get all depressed. And, that, and this is not the time to do that. This is the time to read, learn, play, grow. Literally and fill your brain with things that are going to keep your space and your mind in a positive space. Because if you get drowned out with, oh my God, woe is me, that is not the thing to be doing right now. The time is to literally, like you said, go for the walk, you know, take a brain, clean your space, get in touch with friends that you haven't been with in a very long time, reach out to people that you haven't, you know, just do things that are going to inspire and empower yourself. Take a course you've wanted to take that you haven't taken in a long time. You know, go take, go, uh, you, know, it, you know, there are a lot of, I don't mean a course that's going to cost you money. There's tons of courses that are free. There really are. I mean, the library is a fountain of resources. There's so many courses at libraries and at community centers that are free. Mm -hmm. There are weekend courses. There's daytime, you know, a half a day course. There's a, you know, a one day course. There's so many things you can do that are free. It's it's amazing. And I love that you said that because that's what somebody said. He said, "What am I supposed to do?" I said, "Get back to your library. When was the last time you used your public library?" 
And he said, well, like when I was in college, I said, yeah, they're different places now. And they offer, they also offer free classes. There's books on tape, there's videos, there's audios, there's all kinds of things you can do and research and learn. And it's funny that you mentioned the free courses because that's my next article are all the colleges and universities that are offering free courses to people who simply want to learn. Exactly. And I think we're going to end on that note because that's, I think, Everybody needs to understand that I don't care if you have money, and I don't. And this isn't just for the furloughed people. This is for everybody out there. People that tell me I can't do some things, they don't have the money. There are so many free resources out there, libraries. There's and there's you know community resource centers. There's you know whether you're religious or not. There's a lot of churches out there that actually have free resources where they can actually give you lists of resources for free things. And that where you can actually go learn things. They, they, and they're the ones that have the resources. You can go to whether it be Catholic Charities or Lutheran Services or, I don't know, Unitarian. There's all these churches that have literally lists of resources for you to find out where to go to find out about getting back on your feet, you know, finding um, different courses. They really do. All these different churches have all that. Salvation Army, they all have lists of resources of places where you can go for free courses to get back on your feet. I mean, I mean, so there's like plethora of places to go for free resources and classes. So take advantage of that. Go take courses. I mean, fill your brain with something that's positive. So anyways. Or, and if you feel like you don't have time, you know what? Go get some books on tape. Exactly. And they are there, and so when you you can listen to them in your car, you can listen to them on on your if computer. If you don't have a computer, they're really really inexpensive. The little CD players, you know, they're so inexpensive now. Or a little teeny boombox, they're really really inexpensive now. You can get them at um, thrift shops. I mean, there's so many places. I'm sure someone might even lend one to you. I mean, there's plenty of places to get those that are really really inexpensive. What would you like to leave the audience with? I would just like to say that the many people, when they lose income or they lose their job, they feel as though they've lost their identity. And your job is not your identity. You are your identity. So let's take control, take action, and move forward. Oh, I love that. And I want everyone to know, I want you to learn, play, and grow every single day of your life and never, ever give up. There's always a way. And as usual, it's just been absolutely delight to have Mary C. Kelly with me once again. And I'm always happy to have her on and we'll have many more conversations. So I leave you guys for tonight and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. I love bringing you valuable content. And as usual, I'll put together a page with an embedded podcast and an embedded video. And that is it for tonight. So good night, everybody. And I wish everyone many blessings. and. May you get through this furlough with a positive attitude and a richer mindset and that you grow in some way that you find out some more about yourself. So good night.